Hello everyone. Um, in this video, we are taking a look at one of the probably most iconic 35 millimeter um, range finder, manual focus camera uh, from Konica. And uh, this would be the Konica 3A. And this camera is fully mechanical, means there is no battery inside. The camera operates purely by springs, loaded springs, and uh, the shutter, it's a leaf shutter, so it's able to do flash sync up to 500th of a second, which is pretty amazing. However, it on, it's only got a cold shoe, so um, any flash they're gonna be using, you're gonna be using the PC sync cord right here um, to get your flash synchronized uh, when you're firing the shutter. But uh, this rangefinder, finder, uh, the reason why it's, it's amazing is because it featured a very good viewfinder with a rangefinder system. So the viewfinder in this camera, the 3A, is very nice, very bright. Um, it's not true color because you can see a colored tint when you look through the viewfinder. However, this viewfinder is extremely bright and the rangefinder built in here uh, uses a metal framing that not only compensates for um, parallax correction, but also for distance. So as you move your zoom closer and further, you can kind of see that this mechanism is actually moving around. The, the frame inside moves from top left, kind of hard to see in, of course, in the video. It moves from top left to bottom right. And not only that, the size of the frame also changes to compensate for the distance um, of the subject that you are working on. And uh, uh, this camera features a very sharp hexanon, which is Konica's in-house designed 48 millimeter f2.0 lens. So uh, from what I read, the 48 millimeter f2 is a domestic version of the 3A. Uh, for the imports, Konica actually used a 50 millimeter f1.9 or f1.8, I believe. Um, that lens is slightly faster. Um, however, for that faster, just slightly faster aperture, uh, you are actually sacrificing the compactness of the 48 millimeter lens. So the 50 millimeter lens is actually 10 millimeters wider. So. Uh, this one is right here. It's like, as you can see, extremely compact. So if I take my 35 millimeter SLR here and we take a look, you can see how compact that 50 millimeter, millimeter or 48 millimeter lens is. And this one is probably going to be more similar to the 3A with a 50 millimeter uh, F1.8 lens. Uh, so that's how compact the 48 millimeter lens is. And from what I read, it's an extremely sharp lens. The shutter mechanism, it's a double stroke, okay? So you gotta, you gotta cock the shutter twice. And not only that, as you can see, the shutter or film advance lever is not right here, it's right here. So you stroke it one time to cock the shutter, you stroke it the second time to advance the film. Okay, that's how this camera works. Uh, but I'm telling you, the leaf shutter is extremely quiet. Okay, listen to the shutter release. I'm gonna set it to, 25th of a second, hear that. And that, that's the sound of the shutter, extremely quiet. So again, I'm gonna do it one more time. And we can use a faster shutter speed. We're gonna go to 500th of a second, which actually uses a booster spring uh, to kick the shutter to release a little bit faster. And that's it. It's, uh, super fast, it moves. I can assure you it actually moves, um, but let's do the one second exposure. I'm just amazed by how quiet this range finder is, okay? And again, because leaf shutter, usually they are the quietest type of shutter available. And nowadays, or not even nowadays, but usually you see those leaf shutters uh, on the large format cameras and sometimes on the medium format cameras, uh, film cameras back in the days, but uh, this rangefinder actually featured a uh, Japanese designed uh, Seikosha MXL shutter mechanism. 
So it's also got a few different uh, um, shutter speed synchronization options. Um, I can't really recall what those options are since I don't really use flash on those film cameras. Um, but you do have those MFX options right here, if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, um, the focusing is down by this lever at the bottom. Once you do a CLA on this camera, which is not terribly hard, it's extremely smooth. Like everything's so smooth, um, including the aperture. The aperture is um, clickless, just like movie cameras uh, or movie lenses. So you can move the aperture very nicely and you can see, uh, let me see if I can get the, I'm gonna get it to B mode so you guys can see the aperture moves inside. So this is F22 and which is a plus because it actually goes to F22. Most of the cameras back in the days only goes to uh, F16. So the aperture blade is a five blade system, but still it's, it's very well designed. That's how cool it is with the leaf shutter quietness in the room, right? So that was the B mode also. The B mode, you can long press, use a cable release, and do nighttime photography whenever you're done, just release and it closes the shutter. And uh, um, again, this is the viewfinder for the range for the range finder. This is the actual range finder, which projects a little uh, mirror image into the viewfinder, so you can see a superimposed image. And this is where that frame is. So this one actually casts a frame that corrects for the distance and the parallax when you move uh, the uh, the focusing ring. Okay. Um, again, this camera when it came out, it uses the EV system which is actually corresponding to a lot of old time light meters. So what I have here is again, a 70s Psychonic L188, a very, very reliable light meter that works consistently. So uh, what they use the EV system back then is a very easy indication of what shutter speed and aperture you're supposed to be setting. So with that EV system, this camera actually locks, as you can see, when you turn this EV with a number, it actually locks into place and that turns your shutter mechanism as well as your aperture mechanism. So when you turn the EV, everything turns together, okay? Which is a very thoughtful design. However, it's very hard to implement and very cumbersome to use. So instead of using the EV system, everybody nowadays who gets this camera decouples the EV system. So it's not connected to the shutter speed anymore. It only connects to the aperture, which doesn't affect anything. And it actually makes the aperture easier to turn, okay? So when you have a reading, uh, like right here, this is the reading I got. When you have a reading of EV11 set, um, now you can look at the corresponding aperture and set your desired aperture, which corresponding to the desired uh, shutter speed right here. So. If I, this camera, you know, have F2 lens, so I want to use F2 at 500th of a second. I initially set it at F2 and 500th of a second and a EV11. Now my system is fully decoupled, so it's not gonna turn the shutter speed, but as I turn, if it's not de decoupled, as I turn this ring, supposedly the shutter speed is gonna turn at the same time corresponding to this value. So if we go over here all the way to, you know, 10th of a second or at F8, let's see. So something like that. So if you're at F8, of course, the EV is gonna be, you know, telling you at 30th of a second, that's the correct shutter speed. But obviously over here, we don't have a 30th of a second shutter speed. And only because the shutter on this 3A is also a little bit weird. It doesn't use the standard readings of, you know, 30, 60, 125, and uh, 250. Instead, it uses 10, 25, 50, and 100. You know, pretty weird, but I mean, it's pretty close. So uh, you're not going to mess up your exposure by, um, you know, that, you know, one, ten one tenth of a second exposure difference. And you can easily compensate for that using your aperture. But what I want to do is demonstrate how the original EV system is supposed to work. And uh, if it works, it works ingeniously. Uh, it just works really nicely with 
you know, shutter speed that you don't have to worry about when you change your aperture. Um, especially if you have a very nice uh, old times uh, light meter that have an EV value, which is the easiest thing to use back in the days. Now, if you don't have that, of course, everything's manual. So you get a modern day light meter, which doesn't give you, a, which should still give you an EV value, but nobody uses it anymore. You see, okay, so at F4, I'm supposed to be using 125th of a second. Now you just go here, you set aperture at F4, you line up with that diamond, and uh, you're probably just gonna use 100th of a second of a shutter speed. And because this doesn't have a 125th of a second shutter speed, which is slightly faster, uh, in this case, you could use a slightly, just slightly smaller aperture to compensate for that you know, slower shutter speed, if that's what you want. But uh, um, again, with this kind of quirky shutter speed, you just have to work with it just a little bit uh, to get the full um, pre precision of, of the exposure. But again, with film photography, the film latitude is usually pretty wide. This little small of a difference is not going to make much of a difference in the final results. Um, so we already explored the front features of this camera and actually most of the features of the camera. Um, take a look at the back, pretty plain. You just got your viewfinder right here and the whole case retained a similar design of the old Konica 3. Uh, this version actually improved vastly on the viewfinder to make this such a joy to use. Um, and uh, I'm gonna open up the film door, which is down by looking at the back. It's right here. So it's at the bottom. This is closed, this is open. So actually I'm doing it wrong. So I'm supposed to have this arrow by default with the film inside in the closed position. Because if I don't do that, if I turn this arrow to open, nothing is gonna happen at this moment. The film door is still locked. You have to put this down and press it to open the film door, okay? So imagine if I had this at open position and just flipped over here and I forgot to actually lock it. See what happens if I do this. Your film door gets popped open with a film inside if you load it. So this is the biggest quirk, one of the biggest quirk of this camera, which is this film door release design. If you're not careful, it's very, very easy to open and mess up your whole roll of film. Especially if you forgot to close it and you set it on a table. Very easy to open. Okay, so a good habit, especially if you use this camera for a while, after you close the film door, always lock it to close position, okay? Once you lock it, there's not a lot, a, a latch right here. This is the hole that, that, you know, enables it to open. So if you move it just a little bit even, if you move it over here, the hole disappears, you can put it anywhere you like, just not at open position because that's gonna mess up your film for sure. Biggest design quirks of this camera. The second design, quirk, of course, pertaining to the shutter release right here. I mean, back in the days, everybody's trying to find out the best way to place the shutter release. The people said they put the shutter here to make people who uses the, uh, the left eye to focus much easier so they don't have to move the thing out of your frame. But honestly, um, it doesn't really bother much. Like even for this camera with a viewfinder right at the center, I can kind of just look at the, um, I can kind of just look at the viewfinder and still turn uh, my shutter film advance lever. And honestly, again, the reason that this prevails tells you something. Like this is really the best implementation of where a film advance button should be. It's not gonna be here. Uh, it should be here. It's the easiest way to use for both left and right hand, okay? But this is definitely the biggest, the second biggest design quirk. And uh, it's a double stroke, which doesn't matter as much. It's, it's very easy to double stroke anyways. And it's very quiet. Okay, the, this whole camera is extremely quiet to operate. So great for street photography. And paired with a 50 millimeter lens, you can work a little bit further away from your subject, which, all, which is also a plus. And uh, um, let's take a more closer look at the inside of the camera. This is the design of the internals. And again, the camera is very easy to maintain. You can remove the lens 
uh, using this little like four notches by rotating it and take the entire lens assembly and shutter assembly out and very easily clean everything. So the camera is very easy to maintain. And if you are a little bit handy, a little bit more DIY-ish, you can remove the top very easily and clean the prism if it gets dirty. Um, I did everything. I cleaned the prism. I um, cleaned the shutter from the greasy oil left on the shutter release. So everything works perfectly on this camera now. Like everything works perfectly beaut and beautifully. So I really have no complaints about the whole operation and smoothness of the camera. However, the reason I'm doing this video is because I'm actually selling this camera. Um, oh, this is a film rewind, which is very nicely implemented. It just sits right here very quietly, and once you need to use it, um, you just turn it up and start turning. Uh, usually this kind of knob gives you more leverage, uh, leverage compared to a knob that you just have to physically turn. It's much, much slower, okay? I personally prefer this kind of knob that gives you more leverage, um, but some people would prefer the other kind, which you actually hand turn for that, you know, hand turning filming experience, whatever. Um, that's pretty much about this camera. Um, Self-timer works and it's ex extremely loud. Okay, so just to show you guys. Hear how loud it is. Okay, um, but it definitely works very nicely. But however, the in terms of comfortness of the holding the camera, very, very comfortable over here. This actually... Uh, works as kind of like a, a, a lever or uh, works as some sort of leverage for you to help hold the camera. And I guess they intended for you to hold the camera on the left hand side, not on the right hand side, because this camera on the right hand side is very uncomfortable to hold. Why? Because this lever, it's, it's very rigid and there's a very pointy thing over here that actually just bites into your hand. Like just for a couple of seconds, you can see how hurtful it is if you're not careful enough and touch that shutter self timer okay so not very comfortable to hold in general like what you would do is get a custom custom made case that covers the surrounding area which gives you more grip on the surrounding area so the camera is much easier to hold just like what i had for my om1 um, when you have this grip you for the most part you're just going to be gripping this grip so it's much much more comfortable and the grip is leather so it gives you more comfortness when you're actually um holding the camera it gives you a, a overall better experience anyway but um and uh, did i tell you the reason i'm selling this camera yes because this viewfinder despite the fact it's extremely bright it features a one-time magnification 1 1.0 x magnification that means um, it's very precise to focus because uh, the image is more zoomed in. So what do you see in the viewfinder? If you move your viewfinder out, it's the exact same field as you see outside with your naked eye. A lot of people desire the 1.0 magnification viewfinder. However, however, if you're a glass wearer, if you're nearsighted, this one-time viewfinder is extremely hard to use because for us glass wearers to see it, the entire frame, we have to get as close as possible. However, wearing glasses, you're not able to get your eye as close to the viewfinder to see the entire frame. So the frame gets blocked and I can, I look through the viewfinder. A lot of times I can only see the composition frame and that's pretty much all I see. What I want to do is I can, I want to see more outside of the frame. So when I compose, I can, I can be aware of my surroundings outside of the frame. And that's one benefit of a rangefinder camera compared to the SRR. Otherwise, why would you get a rangefinder, right? It's much slower to use and uh, it's much less comfortable to hold um, and it's much heavier. So the reason to get a rangefinder is for that ability to compose and see things outside of your frame. So you have the ability for more creative control and cropping in on the actual lens that you're using. At least to me, that's a philosophy of the benefit of the rangefinder. And for me, again, that benefit is completely gone with this one-time magnification viewfinder. Um, so yes, it's up for sale on eBay. Uh, hopefully someone who appreciates the camera and have perfect eye that doesn't wear glasses, or if you wear contacts, this camera is gonna give you a great, great um, viewing experience or photo taking experience. Um, 
and for for much much more budget friendly on uh, camera compared to a Leica, which you're gonna spend upwards or at the bare minimum three to four thousand dollars on a simple setup that's well used. This one, beautiful condition, usually sells for you know around two hundred fifty dollars for mint condition, uh, Konica three A. Um, and if you want one that kind of a little more beat up and you need a little more self maintenance, you can probably get this camera for around one hundred fifty dollars. Um, again, this camera is extremely well built. The the chrome on this camera is so thick you don't see any exposed breasts at all. And uh, this camera with a lens weighs about eight hundred some grams, which is around twenty four ounce. Okay, so close to two pounds for this camera. That tells you how well built this camera is. Okay, um, but if you guys have any questions about the Konica three A in terms of you know the physical design or how to use this camera. Feel free to ask me in the comment section down below. Otherwise, I hope you found this video helpful in helping you making a decision on whether you should buy the rangefinder camera for your street photography or you should look for something else, okay? Um, and if you did find this video, video helpful, please do hit the thumbs up button or sub subscribe to my channel. And I should have more film photography related contents coming out for you guys. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care. All right, so just finished uh, one roll of film, so I'm gonna rewind. To rewind, you just press this little button to um, make the uh, rewinding knob loose, and you pop it up, and you start rolling. Thirty-six rolls. And uh, it kind of hurts a little because there's not a, a lot of leverage on the top of the lever. Okay, so once we finish, we just turn back and put this lever to open position. So when the lever is pointing to O, you just press down and it pops up. And you can just take it out. I mean, probably better to put it that way. And now we're gonna actually load a new roll of film in here. Um, but make sure every time you close, you turn this to the close position. Otherwise, it's really easy to accidentally bump and then open your film door during the shooting. Okay. All right, and we're gonna load a brand new roll of film into the Konica 3A. So again, just gonna push this down while it's at opening position. Get your film out. Put your old roll back in here. And put the new roll in. And make sure this tab is pointing inwards. Okay. And close this. Close that. Make sure you change it to close. Make sure. Yep. And we're gonna rewind, which is pressing this lever. set one you want to double check make sure the film is actually properly loaded by just rewinding and you can feel the pressure it is properly loaded okay all right so it's ready to shoot